well, ineffective. Let's see where we can go uh, and let's talk about these proposals. With me in the studio is Sir Jeremy Greenstock. He's former UK ambassador to the UN. And joining me from Mumbai is Neelam Dev, former Indian diplomat and now director of Gateway House, the Indian Council on Global Relations. Thanks to both of you for being here on the programme. Sir Jeremy, to you first of all. What, what do you think of this French idea? I welcome it. I think it started a debate which is extremely interesting that the five permanent members must listen to the voices of other people in the system as to what their legitimate rights really are in a global system that works. I don't think the French proposal is going to carry as it's formulated, but it's being picked up by other groups of member states in the United Nations and reformulated to apply very specifically to atrocity crimes, war crimes, uh, and other uh, criminal acts of governments that come out of reports from the Secretary General of things happening on the ground on those issues where clearly criminal things are being done the veto should be irrelevant to the judgment of member states in their responsibility on the Security Council. Uh, let's go to Mumbai. Uh, Neelam, do you think that the French proposals are, are workable? No credibility in the five uh, veto-bearing members agreeing on anything. I mean, they won't agree on what a mass atrocity is. They won't agree on what uh, kind of resolutions should be undertaken. I mean, we saw that, uh, we see it right now today on who constitutes a terrorist group in Syria, for example. So I don't see that this kind of proposal uh, will get very far. And uh, it may certainly find some support from many countries who really are desperate for a change in the way the Security Council works and in the rapidly eroding legitimacy that it has. So if not these proposals, what do you think should actually change? I think it's really important to focus on the veto precisely for the reason that uh, the veto enables a country that presently has a veto uh, to hold up everything in its own perceived national interests. That's what we're seeing in Syria right now. So uh, the question of uh, uh, an expanded UN and then all these proposals which seek to diminish the uh, use of the veto powers of new members uh, are really red herrings. Uh, if one country can veto, then it doesn't matter if the Security Council has five members or seven or eleven. Yes, and we've so seen that it's really time, the time use of the again. veto that needs to be examined. Yep, we've seen that time and again. So, so Jeremy, just, you know, as a top diplomat, just give me an idea as, at a human level. How frustrating was it over the years to, to try to forge consensus and, and face the vetoes on hugely important votes and, and issues? It, it was frustrating, particularly when the veto was threatened. That happens more often than its actual use. But let's remember that neither France nor the UK has used a veto in the Security Council for over a quarter of a century. We're, we're talking about three powers in particular in modern times that want to... But there's another factor that you... The UN is made up of 193 equal states in, the, in that organization. The most powerful states in the world, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, are not going to always subject themselves to an absolute equal democracy. Sure, However, but I've, got, I've written a list here from the Iraq war to the Middle East to Rwanda to Sudan to Ukraine. You know, they've not been able to get consensus. It, does it ever get to the point where you just think, what is the point of the UN? Let's not be saying... it can't work in those areas. Th this is a very negative approach to the usefulness of the UN. Never in human history have big powers talked to each other so regularly with such a marvellous forum for doing so. The UN intergovernmental system is about governments talking to each other. The UN isn't a separate agency that is either doing its work well or, or, or badly. It's a forum for people to come together and discuss things before they shoot. In that, it has been extremely effective. Neelam, do, do you share that view? And what about the construction of those, those permanent members? I mean, I mentioned in the introduction about India. You haven't got uh, any country from, from South Asia there as a permanent member, you haven't got anyone in Latin America. It, it seems to be structured still very much around the, the post-Second World War days. 
you know, uh, it's a thoroughly undemocratic forum, and not only in terms of using the veto on issues that come before the Security Council under Chapter 7. I mean, the five get together and decide who the next Secretary General is going to be. I mean, this is not democratic, and there has to be a way to open up. And I would like to just conclude by saying that if it doesn't open up, then it will follow the way the international financial institutions are now being challenged. You know, seven years ago, the IMF decided to increase the vote share for countries like China and India. Uh, that proposal is still pending in the U.S. Senate, but everything is happening much faster. And the members, the permanent members of the Security Council themselves ignore the Security Council when they take action, say, precisely in Syria at the moment. Both the United States-led coalition and uh, Russia are in there without any U.N. Security Council sanction. The, the Council will be more and more ignored. Okay. Not only by those who are permanent members, but by everybody else as well, eventually. That, that's a very interesting point. Uh, just time for one more question, Sir Jeremy, because we had uh, Kofi Annan, former Secretary General, on the programme not that long ago. He said his biggest regret as Secretary General was not being able to get the reform of the UN that he wanted. I mean, you have spoken yourself about wider reforms. What is needed... And where is the principal resistance? The principal resistance is to opening up the Charter, because once you open up the Charter, each member state wants its own favourite point to come first. So that, it's easier to block in that sort of institution than it is to construct. The UK would agree tomorrow to India, Brazil, Germany, Japan and African coming on as permanent members of the Security Council. And it would make it more representative, but it would not change the relationship between big powers that has to be sorted out for any specific problem to be solved. That remains. Reform doesn't mend that problem of political fragmentation. That's a different problem. One word. In this generation, do you think we'll have significant reform of the UN? In informal ways, not in formal ways. All right. Uh, Sir Jeremy and Neeland there in Mumbai, thank you so much for being with us and discussing uh, this issue. Thanks very much for your time. Now, do say with